And he came to Nazareth where, it had been, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. And he had uh, what we have heard you did at Capernaum, and do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you that there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came to the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard these things, all the synagogue was filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down from the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to Thanks Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Would you pray with me, please? <coughs> Father, we come before you now with our lives open to you. I pray that your spirit would work in us, that you would take down whatever walls are there so that we would, we would open our whole life to you as we hear you speaking to us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to begin by asking some questions. That's nothing unusual for me. So, by a show of hands... How many of you here believe that you have been called into ministry, that you have a true calling into ministry? How many of you believe that? If you do, please raise your hand. Okay, very, very few of you. That means I've got to ask a bunch more questions. So, here we go. How many of you believe that your Lord God loves you so much, in spite of all your flaws, in spite of your many, many, many sins, that he loves you so deeply, so dearly. How many of you believe that? If you do, raise your hand. That's better. Okay, how about this? How many of you believe that out of this love, Jesus sacrificed himself for you? He took your place. Wait a minute, I'm not done with all of this. I'll, I'll give you the cue, okay? He took your place, he took the punishment that you deserve because of your sins, and he died on that cross so that you would not have to, and, and, and that you could be free from your sins. And, and through this, that's exactly what he's done. In fact, he has made you absolutely perfect, holy, and blameless in God's eyes. Now, how many of you believe that Jesus accomplished that through his sacrifice? Okay, how about this? How many of you believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead, proving that everything he said and did is the absolute truth, and that right now, at this very moment, right now, you are in a right relationship with the Lord, that, that you are part of his family, the Almighty God is your father, your dad, you're his child, you have a life that's never gonna end, you have heaven as your home. How many of you truly believe that Jesus accomplished all of this through his death and resurrection? If so, raise your hand. Good. That's what I'd like to see. All right. One more question. And this one, I need a verbal answer. Okay? The question is, what does all that mean to you? I hear everything. Does it mean everything to you? I'm glad you answered that, because my next question is, 
Are you really living your life like it's everything for you? Every day of your life, is your focus on all that you have in Christ? Is your focus on his death and resurrection? Is your focus on being a child of God? Is that how you're living your life every day? Be honest. No. What I'm getting at here is that by virtue of you trusting in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have your sins forgiven, you've been made part of the God's family, you have a life that's never going to end. You know, he, he bought you at a high price, the blood that he shed, but because of that you belong to him, you're going to be his for all eternity. Okay? Well, as a result of that, guess what? Each and every one of you, every single person in this room, from the youngest to the oldest, has been called into ministry. Every one of you, you can't get away from that. You have been called to serve the Lord, to be totally committed to him and to whatever he calls you to do. You know something? A lot of people don't like to hear that. They really do not like that. Uh, what I've seen in what, 36, 37 years I've been in the ministry, I believe, and I think this is a conservative number, but I believe that most Christians or most people who refer to themselves as Christians would prefer to stay in that non-committal state. They want to be the silent partner, so to speak. That's where they're comfortable. And where they're uncomfortable is when this stuff is brought up and they got to face that biblical truth that they have been called into ministry. That's what our Lord expects of every last one of us. And we have no choice in the matter. We have no choice. We are just like Jeremiah here. Now, did Jeremiah want to get involved in that ministry that God was talking about? Absolutely not. But look at what happens. If you got your Bibles with you, I'll be, I'll be going through all three lessons today. But beginning at verse 4 here, I'm going to be going rather quickly, so you better <laughs> keep up. It says, and I will give a dramatic reading to this as well. I know you'd be impressed by that. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Did you hear that? I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then we hear Jeremiah's response. He, he goes, Then I said, Ah! And that's exactly what he said. It's A-H, only I read it the way he would have said it. He goes, ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Now, does that sound like Jeremiah had a choice in the matter? Absolutely not. He didn't want to be involved with that ministry. He didn't want to get involved at all with it. But he didn't have a choice. It was God who chose him. It was God who would equip him. It is God who would send him. And that's the pattern that I want you to hold on to because we're going to see it again here. Now, if you go to that 1 Corinthians passage that we, we looked at today, verse 28, Paul writes this in chapter 12, verse 28. He says, and God has appointed, there's that word again, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. You can see the same pattern there. God appointed, God called. Then what did he do? He equipped those people for that ministry, and then he sent them to do that ministry. We even see this in the gospel reading from Luke today. Jesus was anointed through the Spirit of the Lord to fulfill the, this prophecy from Isaiah that we read, uh, to, to proclaim good news to the poor. And then it goes on to say this, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You, right there is Jesus' mission statement. That's what he was to do. God the Father sent him to do this. Now, the point of all this is that ministry begins with the Lord God initiating it. 
not us. It is God who calls. It is God who equips. It is God who sends us. And that's what we need to understand. Now, folks, I get it if you feel inadequate for ministry like Jeremiah. And let me ask you, how many of you really do feel inadequate for, for ministry? How many of you? Okay, you feel, uh, how, how, why me? How can I do that? And I understand that. You know, I hear that all the time. In fact, I can't even blame you for it because I feel the same way. Let me tell you a little truth about me, okay? I, and this is the truth, I'm, I'm promising you this. I honestly feel completely, totally inadequate to be a pastor. And it's the truth, I feel inadequate. Compared to all the other pastors out there, believe me, I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer, okay? My, my skills with working with the biblical languages, the ancient Hebrew and Greek, those skills are not very good. To be honest, I'm not a great teacher either. And, and my people skills, well, some of you know, they, they can use some improvement as well. And in fact, you know, I have a tendency to kind of fly off the handle, get upset easily, and, and which means that people are constantly giving me Snickers bars. Incidentally, that's a hint, only I prefer Milky Way. Okay, just so that you know that. It's the Milky Way, because I'm not acting myself. And they give me that, oh yeah. My prayer life, my devotional life, I have one word to sum that up. Embarrassing, and it really is. Yes, I pray, yes, I have a devotional life, but it's nowhere near where it should be for me to grow in this relationship with my God. But besides all of that, what gives me the right to speak to you about your sinfulness when my sins are so, so many. Now, I know people said this before, Pastor, you're being hard on yourself. Forget that, okay? I'm not being hard on myself. I'm not being overcritical. Um, I, I, I'm not. So don't go down that road at all. I am being honest. What I speak to here now is the truth, okay? And the truth is there is absolutely no way that I deserve to be a pastor, no way at all. But you want to know something? That's true of every single pastor. That's true of every one of us. We don't deserve it at all. And yet God calls us to that. Let me give you another example. Look at that passage in 1 Corinthians that we read. Go back to that. We're chapter 13. Who doesn't know about chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians? The love chapter. Okay, Paul is saying here, he's, he's giving us this as a model for our Christian life. Okay, and, and he says, this is how you are to love. And, and this is the special kind of love. I've shared this with you many, many times before. This is agapeo in the Greek, or agape. This is a Christ-like love, a selfless, sacrificial love that is immersed in humility, it is immersed in courage, and even in suffering. And Paul says, okay, this is how we are to love. And then he defines it even more. He says about this love, he says, this love is patient. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It doesn't insist on his own way. And why do you say, well, praise God for that? I mean, when you read it, oh, thank the Lord for that. It doesn't insist on its own way. It, it doesn't... Uh, uh, rejoice in the wrong it rejoices in the right it's not irritable it's not resentful this love bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things paul says this love never ends okay i don't care who you are i don't care if you're the most committed christian in the history of humankind there is no way that you can love perfectly in that way it's impossible. God can. We can't. It, it, we, 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 we fall short. We cannot meet God's standards. Like Jeremiah, we feel inadequate again. What I'm getting at is that, folks, we are always falling short of who God calls us to be and what God calls us to do. We're always falling short. But you know something? Don't you think the Lord knows that? Don't you think he really understands that? Of course he does. Look at what he did with Jeremiah. I love this. Jeremiah, he was, uh, boy, he's a lot like me. He was scared to death 
of, of going to these people. He thought the people were going to be hostile. They were going to hurt him. They would possibly kill him. Okay, he was scared to death. God says in verse 8, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. He's saying, Jeremiah, I'm walking right by your side. I am going to protect you. I've got this. Trust in me. I've got this. And then Jeremiah said, well, wait, wait a minute. I don't know what to say. I'm just a kid. Once again, God comes back and says, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. He says, don't worry about it. I've got this too. I'll tell you what to say. You see, folks, that's where our focus needs to be. That's where our emphasis, not on ourselves. Our focus needs to be on the Lord who really does have it. He's got everything under control. I mean, on our own, let's face it, we're all train wrecks, right? <laughs> we are. We are sinners, and there is no way that we are equipped for any kind of ministry at all. But that's my point. We're not on our own. Because our Lord Jesus loves us so much that, that he poured out his blood for us to free us from our sins, that, that he paid that high price to make us his own, we belong to him. We're part of God's family forever and ever. We're going to celebrate that one day to its fullest in, in heaven, and we are going to be with him. Now think about that again, and let me think, let, I want you to think about that question I asked you earlier. What does all of that really mean to you? You know, earlier you said, hey, it means everything to us, but then when I ask you, are you living your life like that? You go, uh-uh. Okay, so we know it should mean everything to us. It should. This, this should be our focus in life. This should be our peace, our joy, our hope, our confidence. Every single day of our life, we should be living in this great, great truth. But do we? No. Why? We get distracted, like I talked about with the kids. Maybe not with a bowl full of candy, but we get distracted by this world. We get distracted by everything that's going on in this world. And I brought up as an example, I thought of it this morning, you know, look at our own society. Where do you see people focusing a lot? I mean, uh, you sit back and you watch, see, where are they really focused? You know where? Entertainment. I mean, think about that. Whether it's themselves playing golf or tennis or whatever, or pickleball. Poor Jimmy can't play pickleball anymore. But, or, or whether it is uh, watching the Super Bowl. You know, I've been asked several times, because I'm from New England, who do, you care, who, do, who do you want to win? I says, I could care less. I've given up on the NFL anyways. Ever since they forgot how to kneel, or how to stand up instead of kneeling. But anyways, you know, it, it's focused on, on this entertainment. Right now we are in the season of the awards, aren't we? You know, you got the Golden Globes and you got the Academy Awards coming and it's where all those rich and famous people come together and they pat each other on the back and tell them how wonderful they are and how much smarter than they are than us, that they know the right way to live. Who cares if they've been divorced 17 times? They know how to live. You know, but you see, we get distracted by the things of this world. We get distracted by the things that are going on in our life and all the events and everything like this. And when that happens, the Lord loses importance in our life. We, 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 we lose sight of him. He, he becomes an afterthought. He gets shoved aside, and, and we just don't have time for him. You know, we, we don't have time to spend, to, to really get to know him so well in his word. We, we don't have the time to just sit down and talk with him in prayer. A lot of times we don't even have the time to come here to, to worship him. we got other things going on. You know, priorities. Come on. Priorities. And that's how we are. Now, some may be like that right here today, but I, all of us have been there. Every one of us has been there. Now, does that mean that we are <laughs> hopelessly lost? No, no, absolutely not. Well, you, maybe me, but not you. Okay, you're not hopelessly lost. We've got to understand that as well. Our life can change. Things can be different for us in our life. They really can. But folks, for that to happen, we need to surrender to the Lord. And, and what I mean by that is not just a partial surrender, not just bits and pieces, because we've already done that. You wouldn't be here if you haven't surrendered part of your life to the Lord. We need to surrender our whole life to him. And we all know those parts in our life that we have not surrendered to him 
We need to bring those walls down and be wide open to him in our life in every area of life. We need to surrender like that. That's when things change in our life. Our Lord needs to become just that, our Lord. The one who is king, the one who is ruling in our life. He, he needs to be our true north, the one who guides us, who gives us direction in our life. He needs to be that, not society, not ourselves. He needs to be that. He needs to be our savior who loves us so much that he freed us from the guilt, the pain, the emptiness, the death, the hell, and everything else that sin brings into our life. And he's brought us these amazing gifts of love that we can't even imagine why he would do it, but he gives it to us anyways. Forgiveness, we, we've been made a family, a family member, so get used to each other. We're spending eternity together. We, we've, been, we've been given heaven. Folks, that's where our focus needs to be because when it's there, that's when we see we've got everything in Christ. We've got everything in him. Now, are we going to be perfect at doing this? No. I'm not even going to come close. But we can strive to do this. If we do, if our Lord Jesus becomes that important to us in our life, if, if we focus on him, on his love for us, on everything that we have right now because he loves us so much like this, if, if Jesus becomes that important, that vital to us, then our love for him is just going to grow and grow and we're going to love him like we've never loved him before. And folks, that's the key to all ministry. Love. That's what is behind it. It is this love that enables us to be so committed to our Lord that, that the ministry that he has called us to, it becomes second nature. It just becomes part of us. But it's love that does that. Now, with that in mind, let's get to that newsletter that I wrote, the article in January's newsletter. How many of you read that? Okay, if you haven't, Read it. In that, I talked about uh, the various reasons why our attendance, why our uh, membership has significantly went, gone down. It, it has dropped significantly in the past few years. And if you look at that, you'll find various reasons. And by the way, one of the reasons, it's me. Sorry about that. But some have left because of me. Okay? But one other thing that I have found with this, and this is what people who have left have, have shared this with me, that they were leaving because this congregation does not have the ministries that they want for themselves, for their families, and for their children. And so rather than just trying to stay here and build up these ministries, they'd rather go to these churches, usually a larger church, that has all these things going on already and everything is going, going fine there. And I can't blame them because they're right. We don't have these ministries. And a big reason why we don't, if you want to call it manpower or people power, but we don't have leadership, people willing to take leadership in that role. I mean, just take a look at our youth ministry. I know we have Pastor Tim, but we've been searching for people to help out with youth for so long, and nobody wants to take that responsibility. We don't have the, the, the people to do that. It, unfortunately, it's, it, it's, we're like, well, I think we're like all congregations. The minority of the people are doing the majority of the ministry. It, it's, we, it may be that way always but but that is what is 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 happening in our church and it seems that most people would prefer to just be non-committal kind of be the silent partner in all of this now the reason why i'm sharing this with you is not to lay any guilt on you so let's get that out of the way right now if there's any guilt i take it okay not you so it's not about guilt. The reason why I'm sharing and we're doing this sermon series is to help us to refocus on our Lord, to see so clearly once again that we've got everything in him so that he means everything to us. I believe that's the only thing that'll move us to a greater love for the Lord. And, and as I said earlier, that love enables us to be fully committed to the Lord and fully committed to this ministry that he calls us to. 
Now, right now, I, I believe we're at a crossroads at this congregation. Definitely at a crossroads. And with generation to generation, which I mentioned earlier, uh, with this ministry that we're trying to implement, and you're going to hear more about this in the weeks and months to come, because we just started the very beginning of this two-year process, but this ministry is totally geared to helping us develop ministries for every age of this group, for all people, from the youngest child to the oldest adult here. And this is what we're going to be doing. So if there's any particular area of ministry that you're really interested in, if there is a, a, a gift that the Lord has given to you, you and you want to put that gift to, to work, boy, we could sure use your help. We sure could use you. I mean, I think this is, can be an amazing time for this congregation. I, I, I'm looking very optimistically, especially when I see so many here today. I'm glad to see that. But I think this can be an amazing time for us. But for that to happen, we need you. Not just some. We need every one of you. And so today, I'm asking you to think about this. I'm asking you to, to, to really dwell on this, to pray about this, and then act upon it. And I just pray that all of us will, will have the love to answer this call into ministry. Let's pray about it now. Father, first of all, we come here today in your grace. Uh, knowing that we're your children. But as children do, they, we do some not so good things at times. We live for ourselves, not for you. We think about ourselves, not you. And when we're that way, the, 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 what you have called us to do, the ministry, and whatever that ministry might be, it gets put aside. Lord, help us now to focus so much on you, on, on our Savior Jesus, and on everything that we have, because you loved us enough to, to save us, to, to make us your children. Help us to focus on that, so that our love for you will grow, because it's from that love that ministry happens. Through that love, give us that desire to follow that call into ministry. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.